Molly, our Green MEP. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a really exciting time to be in ah! politics and to be a green politician because we're seeing a genuine realignment in our political system. You can see that it's Caroline Lucas in the House of Commons that is making a different case, making the case for a better future. The Greens are the party offering the real alternative. People know that we're offering something different and they're asking, why don't I see that on my TV? And I think we're just about to break through. We are beginning to break through that blockage. And we know from the polls about what people want that our policies are the popular policy. People are looking at politics in a different way. They're looking for a genuine alternative. Greens have got that alternative. So 2015 is a huge opportunity for us. We've got wonderful candidates here today. I'm very proud that we've got a full slate already in Gloucestershire, and I'm very proud to be able to present them to you. This, as I see it, the politics of austerity is using the financial crisis as an opportunity to move politics massively to the right, cut wages, uh, reduce conditions of work, and so on. And the reason that can be done is by saying what we, you know, that the debt's there, we've got to reduce the debt, and the only way to reduce the debt is to you know, introduce all these policies, shrinking the state, all the things that the right have been wanting to do all along. So the alternative way to deal with that is to look the debt square in the face and say, where did that debt come from? And you know, how are we actually going to tackle it? And that is that takes you directly to this question of money reform. Because if you have a money system that can only create money when it creates a parallel debt, then you are inevitably just going to go on creating more debt. And if you paid off your debts, there'd be no money. So it's an absurd way of creating money. Rents are inf inflated. Uh, the supply of rented housing is constrained heavily, uh, bearing in mind that there are a million homes lying empty and unused. And precisely, uh, the benefit almost entirely goes to private landlords in, ra in reality. Uh, they are receiving a social benefit from the state. The federal tax that was brought in has actually caused more social tenants to move into private um, lodgings, which has forced up the housing benefit bill, which was predicted by many smarter people than I. Um, and that's what we're seeing now with the dramatic rise in housing benefit. And in fact, the government hasn't cut the welfare budget as they promised to do, or as they claim to be able to do, is actually increased massively. It's clear that actually it is a Green Party policy to introduce uh, rent controls um, and to scrap the bedroom tax and to end the right to buy. So, you know, there, is, there, there are ways of tackling the housing market. Um, and also, the, the price of rent is linked to the, to the cost of housing, of buying housing, and that also is linked to the money supply and the banks who want to lend on assets rather than lend on businesses. Yes. Policy, with a policy like right to buy, that is at the, at the pay of the private sector. So even though it sounds like, on the outset, quite a nice policy, you've got the right to buy your house. That sounds fantastic. You buy it, but what about the generation after you? The generation after you has got a smaller pot of social housing tax to select from. These lists are very long. Um, and so you're forced into the private market. You're at the pay of these market forces, and you have to pay that private rent. So the figure that you quoted earlier, I think, is as a result of the last 30 years of us selling off the housing stock in this country. Building, uh, spending money on flood defences is actually one of the highest um, sort of physical multiplier. It actually returns £8 to the Treasury for every pound spent on flood defences through savings in insurance and through rebuilding and through sort of the collateral damage that, that's caused by flooding. So it's actually a very sensible idea to spend considerably more money on flood, flood defences instead of what the Coalition has done, which is cut the budget, basically, even though they've claimed that they have actually increased it in real terms, that's actually not true. And places like Shrewsbury are going to continue flooding. Equally, there's been a lot of good talk, I think, about managing the headwaters of rivers. Uh, the water which comes to us started somewhere else. Um, and I'm not sure that that's being taken seriously. So that's at a sort of national level. And then you come down to the point we've just made here, that in addition to that, we need flood defences, and the money has been cut for that. So it's a green issue all the way down the river, so to speak. It's about sustainable land management, so also taking opportunities to, to, uh, to, for that, to uh, hold water in the landscape, and possibly generate energy from that, hydroenergy, also create natural habitats, new water landscapes. And then, of course, in some cases, retreating. 
entirely from some areas because they're just not sustainable to keep. And uh, a great deal of support for those people who are in those communities who are, you know, who are under threat from flood. The question is just stop building on floodplains. We've got an application in front of the district council um, Tuesday, and it is known that they want to build a supermarket and housing on a floodplain. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know, it's it's there. The you know, agencies say it's a floodplain. I mean, it's I mean, it's almost unbelievable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, th I think it would be difficult to be less competent than the current government. <laughs> 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 They sell a fantasy based on a riddle, based on a lie, based on a ruse, and it's just breathtaking that they've taken, you know, they, they've taken us all for a ride, quite simply. So we can hardly be less confident. We also, we always have a cost of manifesto. I mean, we've never not had a cost of manifesto. We've had one at the last general election, we'll have one at this general election. Um, it, all growth does is just make profits for those at the top. Um, how can growth continue indefinitely with finite resources? It just can't. It's not possible. Um, but just to say that there was a, a report recently in the Telegraph about the Greens doing very well, and I was cited as an example because I'm the new MEP. And um, it said, you know, Molly Scott Cato is a new MEP and an avid beekeeper. And this was, <laughs> <laughs> this was rather interesting because I've never kept bees. and it's through really inventive and creative things. Because I think people like it. I mean, there's no doubt going around and talking to people, knocking on doors that people know what we're about, and they're excited about it. In terms of the sort of 
the, the values and the morals. I mean, the, this is four pages, the philosophical basis of the Green Party, and I couldn't recommend it more highly as, <laughs> as a document to read. That I completely take on board what you're saying, and I think possibly one of the issues that we as a Green Party in, in the past haven't done well enough is to actually frame our own argument and take <coughs> forward our argument in, in our own context. And we've actually spent a lot of time saying, oh, we, we're not just an environmental party, we're not this. Yes, we do have a proper economic basis. And, and what UKIP did and have done is actually they've framed their own argument and they've made everybody else come and answer that argument. And I think what we do need to do is take our philosophical base, take our desire for social justice, take the point that we're, we're sort of neither left nor right, but we're outside of that continuum. We, we don't sit on it, we're outside of it, and actually reframe the political argument and take it where, where we want to go. And I, you know, I hope I'm going to be working with Chris on his parliamentary campaign, and I hope that, that we can do that and achieve that. And hopefully, the six candidates sitting here today, we will be in contact and we will look at that framing and that message for Gloucestershire, which will be a green message and not necessarily just a response to, oh, you don't understand economics and you're just about the environment. And that the Lib Dems were at 3% in 1989. You know, why can't we do the same? Why can't we do that now and get your MPs 70 MPs? Why should we do that? We engage with people. Um, so where I used to live with my parents up until recently, um, I'm a council state in Cheltenham, so when I used to run for councillor, I go knocking on doors and asking for signatures. You talk to people about politics and it's a dirty word. Um, it's something they don't want to engage in. It's something they feel like they've been pushed out of. And it's something that, it's nothing to do for them. It's, it's not our thing, it's not politics. You talk to them about the Green Party policies, and they, they, you know, it sounds like a good idea, this sounds like something new, this sounds like something they do want to engage with, but it seems something separate from politics for them. So linking with the Jack's question, actually, I think you have to tell people there is another way of doing politics and move what we're doing, even though it's so different, move it into that political sphere and actually tell people this is an option, this is a viable option, but we are completely different to everything outside. But also as well, engage those people who don't vote, because I think the people who aren't voting are turned off of politics because of the, what those main parties offer and because of how similar it is. And I don't think we need to assume um, that young people are all turned off politics. I mean, there was that recent YouGov poll that kind of um, pitched the Greens as being second among young people polled as you know, being a party that appeals to them. So I think that we've really got a place in, in, in that sphere. I think young people have not been turned off by politics as such, but I think they've been turned off by the, by, you know, the centre-right, the, the right um, you know, wing brand of politics that we've been... Um, we've had no choice though, over the last 35 years, pretty much. So I think that we can go out there and, you know, as, as the rest of the panel have actually said, if we can get a positive message out there. We have Gemma Clark, who's our candidate in Chiefsbury. <laughs>